Good morning, my name is Joelle and I work at the Swedish Cancer Institute. I'm a certified tobacco treatment specialist and I work as a nurse practitioner in our tobacco related diseases and lung cancer screening program. Every day I help people quit smoking and this video is intended to help you learn how you can quit smoking successfully and confidently. Before we get started, I just want to um, mention a couple of disclosures. One is that I mention a lot of products in this uh, video, and I want you to know that I do not have any financial interest in these products that are described in the lecture, and I am not a representative of any of the companies who manufacture the products uh, that are discussed in this lecture. So there's a few things that I'm hoping to relate to you today. The objectives of this course are to identify how nicotine affects the body and leads to dependence. I'm hoping that by the end of the lecture you can uh, list signs and symptoms of nicotine withdrawal, that we can uh, list prevention and treatment options for nicotine withdrawal, and that you can identify methods to cope with lapse and relapse from nicotine, and understand how to quit successfully and confidently. Now just to get started, I want you to think about a couple of things. Number one, there are a few things that we know about smokers, and this may apply to you. One is that the percentage of smokers who want to quit every year is 70 percent. Many people want to quit smoking. Forty percent make an attempt every year, and seven percent are successful on the first time. For people who try to uh, quit smoking cold turkey, they have about a 3.5 percent chance of being successful. Another um, little tidbit about nicotine is that it takes about 10 days for the toxins to clear out of your bloodstream. Now when you're considering quitting smoking, it's helpful to consider what your motivations are. And on a scale of 0 to 10, I want you to think about how motivated you are to quit today. And while you think about that, also consider what those motivations are. People often say that they can't, smell, can't stand the smell or the taste of smoking, and they just know it's time. Many people say that they never thought they would smoke as long as they did when they started. Now, think about the confidence that you have in quitting smoking on a scale of 0 to 10. Rate yourself, 10 being the most confident that you could quit if you wanted to today. Common reasons for low confidence and ability to quit are many. People often have failed attempts to quit in the past, and this really knocks their confidence down. They feel that they just have too much stress in their life, and often the stress is never ending and it makes it difficult to quit smoking. They live or work or um, spend time in social situations that make it difficult to smoke because they're with other smokers. Some people often say that they don't want to quit and many people say that they have a low confidence in knowing how to quit smoking because they don't know how to. Now cigarettes can impact your body and that's why we're talking about quitting smoking today. There are many different hazardous contents of cigarettes, and we've heard them all. There are contents that you can't see, but they're folded into those cigarettes, and when you light the cigarette, the combustible gas is inhaled into your lungs and delivered to your body. When those toxic gases are inhaled and circulating through the bloodstream, they move throughout all of your body, and they impact almost every organ uh, there is. Unfortunately, it degrades cells and it um, causes damage to the vessels and the body has a difficult time recovering from that, especially with repeated exposures. These would be called tobacco-related diseases, heart disease, lung disease, vascular disease throughout uh, the body, and it can contribute to a host of different cancers. Dependence on nicotine occurs for one major reason. It's a molecule that can be ingested, it can be smoked via snuff, chewing tobacco, or inhaled via cigarettes. Now today we're going to talk about what it means to smoke a cigarette and how that nicotine dependence occurs when we smoke a cigarette. If you take a look at this graph, you can see the cigarette is numbered one at the mouth. The cigarette is combusted, it's on fire, you inhale the smoke, into the lungs, which is number two on your graph, it very quickly transfers from the lungs to the bloodstream, which is number three. It goes to the heart within seconds, and that is number four, and it terminates at the brain, which is number five on your graph. From the time you inhale a puff off the cigarette to the time it reaches the brain, it takes about seven seconds. It's very, very quick. 
Now when it gets to the brain, it's gone through the arterial blood system and it's gone to the brain very quickly and it saturates the brain with a very big kapow. Inside the brain you have these little receptors called nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And these receptors are very um, unique and they respond very specifically to nicotine. When the nicotine goes to the brain, it attaches to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. They really like to hang out together and they have a polarity for each other. So the nicotine attaches to the receptors. And when this occurs, there's a lock and key mechanism that occurs and there are hormones that are released from those nicotinic receptors. When you take a look at the saturation of the nicotine in the brain, it's very interesting. Currently we're looking at a series of pictures of the brain. On the left, you'll see a brain that has some green and yellow and orange radio tracer that is currently attached to the nicotinic receptors in the brain. That's before a cigarette is smoked. You can see that it's labeled nothing. After one puff, you can see a little bit of the blue saturating the brain. That's the nicotine. When you get to three puffs and one cigarette and three cigarettes, you can see that the nicotine has saturated the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and the brain is, is virtually saturated with the nicotine. It's very, very effective. Now when that lock and key occurs in the brain, once the nicotine attaches to the receptor, there is an outflow of neurohormones. And neurohormones come in very many different varieties. Dopamine is the most abundant hormone that is released when the nicotine attaches to the receptor. And as you can see on the screen, there are a number of receptors and a number of physical and psychological effects when those neurohormones are released from that receptor. Now, some of the most common um, responses from those hormones is to feel calm, to uh, feel like you have an increased ability to concentrate. Um, people often feel like they can focus, they feel happy, sort of warm and fuzzy inside. Nicotine definitely has an effect on the bodies when the neurohormones are then released after the nicotine attaches, attaches to those receptors. Now that's very powerful because those neurohormones feed the reward system in the brain. Unfortunately, if you don't have another cigarette, the nicotine starts metabolizing in the body and it starts degrading. And within an hour or two, the nicotine that you inhaled from that last cigarette has gone away. And if another cigarette hasn't been smoked, then you um, will start experiencing withdrawal symptoms. Now this is the feeding cycle of nicotine dependence. You can see at the top you have a cigarette. Then the nicotine is delivered to the brain in a matter of seconds. Then clockwise, going down to about the four o'clock position, you feel relaxed and feel good because you've stopped your craving. But when you get down to about the seven o'clock position on that graph, you can see that the nicotine levels in the body start getting lower and then by the time you get up to the 10 o'clock position of that graph, you begin to feel withdrawal symptoms and craving to have a smoke. And that's because the nicotinic receptors are now um, absent of the nicotine and that lock and key has dropped off and there's no more dopamine or other neurohormones that are being released into the uh, bloodstream and feeding the reward center of the brain and you'll start feeling the exact opposite symptoms that you had when the neurohormone levels were elevated. You'll start feeling like it's difficult to concentrate, people can feel moody, agitated, even depressed if they go without a few cigarettes or for that matter go a, a longer duration without cigarettes. People can feel very physically ill. So here are some uh, lists of the various symptoms that people may have when they're going through withdrawal either major or minor, and these are very unpleasant. They're so unpleasant that the symptoms often drive people to go have another cigarette. So how do we prevent withdrawal? How do we get you over that hump so that you can successfully quit smoking without having to experience some of these symptoms that you've probably experienced in previous quit attempts? Now I think of treatment as the difference between a crash landing and a smooth landing. Many people try to go it alone. Many people attempt to quit by going cold turkey or they try different modalities, but they haven't really had the benefit of knowing 
what is the best way to approach this and trying to come off the cigarettes can be a really rocky landing. With treatment and a strategic plan in place, quitting smoking can be like bringing a plane in for a smooth landing. Now, there's a number of options and we're going to talk about that now. Nicotine replacement therapy has been around for decades. Most people know about it, but there are a few specific pieces of information I'm going to give you today that I hope will be helpful to you because many of these are options over the counter. There's nicotine replacement therapy, there are a couple of prescription medications, and um, there are non-prescriptive and non-pharmacologic approaches as well, and we'll talk about that. So let's first talk about the long-acting transdermal patch. The long-acting transdermal patch is exactly that, long-acting. The whole idea behind this medication is that you put it on your skin and it delivers a steady state of nicotine replacement therapy for a long duration of time. Typically, they're 24-hour patches. So from the time you put the patch on, the nicotine level rises and it maintains a steady state until two or three hours before it's time to change the patch again. Now, the patch comes in three different doses. And we're going to talk about how to dose it, but it comes in 21 milligrams, 14 milligrams, and 7 milligram doses. Now, one cigarette equals approximately one milligram of nicotine. So if you're smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, you want to reach for the 21 milligram patch. It's very important to dose the nicotine patch according to how much you're smoking, just to be sure that you're getting enough nicotine replacement similar to if you were smoking. If we don't replace the nicotine via the patch at an accurate, or at least close to an accurate dose of what you're accustomed to, you'll experience withdrawal symptoms and you'll be at risk for relapsing. Now, if you smoke closer to three quarters of a pack a day, you would want to dose it at 14 milligrams. And if you're at about a half a pack or less, then you'd want to reach for the seven milligram patch. Now, you may remember earlier in the slide deck, I showed you that the, um, uh, when you have a cigarette, the nicotine goes into the bloodstream very rapidly and you get a big concentration of nicotine replacement to the brain from smoking a cigarette. Now, when we're replacing nicotine via a patch or by mouth that is a non-cigarette, you will not get the same quick kapow to the brain and you need to have a realistic understanding of that so that you're not expecting the same type of response when you use a, uh, some of the um, nicotine replacement therapy when you're treating yourself to um, prevent with uh, relapse. So when you utilize the nicotine patch, you most definitely won't experience that. It's a slow ramping up of the medication and a steady state, but you will not feel a surge in your brain like you do when you have a cigarette. Same with some of the short-acting nicotine replacement therapy methods, what we're going to talk about now. When you use these options, it takes about 7 to 10 minutes to get to your brain versus 7 seconds. So understanding how they work and having a strategic plan is very helpful so that you can prevent breakthrough urges. Now, short-acting nicotine replacement therapy is a quicker acting compared to the patch. The patch goes in, it maintains a steady state over a long period of time, and then it slowly digresses in dose delivery, and that's right when you're getting ready to put another patch on. The short-acting nicotine replacement therapy comes in four modalities. But the whole idea is that you use when you're having an urge to have a cigarette. So they're for those breakthrough periods of time, even though the patch is on your arm and you're getting nicotine replacement therapy, you can still have some breakthrough um, urges to have a cigarette and you want to plan for those and be prepared. Now the gum and the lozenges come, uh, you can purchase them over the counter, they come in two and four milligram doses. And again, it's important to choose the right dose for you. If you smoke one pack a day or less, the most appropriate dose of gum or lozenge for those breakthrough urges to have a cigarette is the two milligram dose. If you're smoking greater than a pack a day, then purchase the four milligram pieces of lozenge or gum. Now the gum is, um, can be a little high maintenance. It's not for everyone, but often people will come to me and say, ah, oh, that gum, it doesn't work. And it's often because they're not experiencing benefit from it because they didn't get to use it the appropriate way and they didn't know how. 
The gum is very specifically intended to be chewed until you feel a zingy flavor in your mouth. Some people say it's even peppery. And as soon as you experience that in your mouth, you need to park it between your cheek and your gum. When it's parked between the cheek and the gum, then you're getting your nicotine delivery. You don't want to swallow the nicotine. It often will cause nausea, turn your stomach upside down, but more importantly, you will not absorb the nicotine. Nicotine does not absorb in an acidic environment and your guts are full of acid. So when you chew the gum, you chew and park it for five minutes, then you chew it again until you experience that zingy flavor, and then you will park it again for another five minutes. And you rotate that for about 30 minutes, and then you spit the gum out. Now the lozenge comes in two different sizes. So it comes in two different doses, and it comes in two different sizes. It comes in sort of a round wafer that's a little smaller than a Tums, and it comes in a little mini lozenge that's a little bigger than a Tic Tac. And again, you want to tuck it between your gum and your cheek to optimize the delivery of the nicotine replacement. Now you want to use these medications when you're having an urge to smoke. You can use it on an as-needed basis, but you can also use these on a planned basis. If you know you're going to get yourself into a situation that would typically trigger having a cigarette and it's going to make it difficult, then plan ahead and chew a piece of gum or get a lozenge in your mouth before you land into a situation that you know may be a big high risk setting, especially if it's a social setting when, where you may encounter smokers or some of the more germane um, activities in your life that often trigger having a cigarette. That could be getting in the car to drive to the grocery store. For some people, it's taking a walk with their dogs and they'd love to have a cigarette. Um, but plan ahead. Always have your nicotine replacement therapy with you. So when you want to use the lozenge, you just park it in your mouth and you let it dissolve. You don't have to chew it. <clears throat> just park it, let it dissolve. When you have the gum or the lozenge in your mouth, we would recommend that you only drink water if you need to drink something until you're done with the dose and then you can drink anything you want to. Now, nicotine replacement therapy also comes by prescription. There's a nicotrol inhaler, and uh, the nicotrol inhaler is an apparatus that is about this long. It's plastic. It has little cartridges that have about 80 puffs of nicotine in them, and you get them from the pharmacy. They're prescribed by your uh, medical provider, and you can put the cartridge into the apparatus and twist it, and then when you're ready to use it for breakthrough urges to have a cigarette, you just puff on it, but you, you don't want to take a deep inhalation like you're having a cigarette. You want to just puff on it and suck it into your mouth because again, the nicotine replacement therapy is being absorbed into the mucosal tissue of your mouth. The nasal spray is very similar in its absorption, but it's in the nose. And instead of pointing it up towards your sinuses, you want to point it towards the septal wall of your uh, nose and that's where the medication is absorbed. Now the nasal spray is the most effective in delivery. It absorbs a bit quicker than the gum, the lozenge, and the nicotrol inhaler. You also need a prescription for the nasal spray by a medical provider. So this is just a reminder. The gum, the lozenge, the oral inhaler, and the nasal spray are all absorbed in the mucosal tissue of either your mouth or your nose. When you're utilizing the agents for your mouth, avoid carbonated beverages, fruit juices, um, tea, coffee, all of those are potentially acidic and will neutralize the effects of the nicotine replacement therapy. A lot of people ask me what the cost of these agents are and so I did a price check at about six different places and that included Costco, Sam's Club, uh, Walgreens, Fred Meyer, and I've listed a range of uh, prices based on these various stores. Now I'm not going to tell you which stores were more expensive, but I will tell you that if you're interested in utilizing these agents, I would encourage you to go do some price checking to see what you can get. Um, some are definitely cheaper than others. Cigarettes, at least in the state of Washington, cost around $8.50 to $10 per pack. And on a 30-day cycle, that's, um, or 30-day month, that comes out to about $300. A nicotine patch, the cheapest I could find, came 
in at $2.50, and the most expensive was at $3.40. That's what they averaged in a packet of seven. And nicotine lozenge and gum, I averaged for 10 pieces a day at 30 cents a piece. And 10 pieces would be very, very generous. Most people, if their patch is dosed correctly, only require somewhere around five pieces of gum or lozenge a day. And, and many people are even less than that. But I was generous in my estimate, and that came out to $3 a day at 30 cents a piece. Um, and that uh, equals about $90 a month. Now, the cost savings while on treatment, the treatment is recommended for a minimum of 12 weeks. And if you look at the total monthly savings between smoking and utilizing the patch plus the gum or lozenge, it came out to about $108 savings in the three, each month in the first three months. And that was a total savings of $324. Now, after you get past the three months treatment period and you're not purchasing the nicotine replacement therapy or the cigarettes, there's a, a more substantial savings of $3,000 in that um, following nine months for an annual $3,324 savings in that first year when you quit smoking. I always encourage people to consider um, uh, making a plan to reward themselves when they are um, quitting smoking. It's um, sort of an incentive, thinking about your motivations, um, uh, changing up your lifestyle a little bit so that you are um, creating some new habits and rituals in your life to uh, support your new lifestyle without cigarettes and also just um, even perhaps considering tucking that money away, the savings from not purchasing the cigarettes and reward yourself at, at intervals of time or after that first year of being successful, staying quit off the cigarettes. Now, a lot of people are very interested in e-cigarettes. For some people, this is becoming a fad. Uh, e-cigarettes have a strong presence in our community now, especially amongst the uh, younger populations in our community. and. Um, and I just want to make it clear that the e-cigarette is different than the Nicotrol inhaler that I previously described. The Nicotrol inhaler is the prescription nicotine replacement therapy that has a little cartridge with nicotine in it. That is not an e-cigarette. That is purely nicotine and it is considered nicotine replacement therapy. Now e-cigarettes are manufactured by various um, folks including the tobacco um, companies and the contents of those e-cigarettes are not well known at this time because they're not regulated by the FDA. The e-cigarettes are, um, many people think are a lot safer than smoking cigarettes because it's a vapor. Some people call it vaping to use the e-cigarettes. But it's a battery operated um, apparatus and it has these little fluid filled cartridges that have polyethyl glycol. When you inhale off of it, uh, you get a dose of nicotine, what other chemicals are in that, and um, you inhale the polyethyl glycol, um, which our feeling is that it may not be necessarily safe. But uh, one of the other hazards of utilizing the e-cigarettes is that, again, you're inhaling the nicotine and it's going straight to your brain. And um, it is definitely carrying the nicotine dependence. And so for people who are really interested in getting past their nicotine dependence and getting off all substances, um, e-cigarettes could make it very difficult to do that. So e-cigarettes are not a regulated product. The safety is not well established and no recommendations for use of that product can be recommended at this time. So let's talk a little bit about prescription medications. Most people have heard that there are tablets that you can take to help you quit smoking. The first medicine that we're gonna talk about that requires a prescription for your medical provider is called Welbutrin. It actually goes by several names, Bupropion, Zyban, Welbutrin. They're all the same medication and they all work exactly in the same mechanism. Now, this medication has been around for many decades. It's traditionally noted to be an antidepressant and it does work at higher doses as an antidepressant. But the way it works as an antidepressant is to drive the exact same neurohormones that you get a surge of when you have a cigarette. And so the Welbutrin drives the dopamine and the serotonin and norepinephrine up 
it helps cut the crave and the urge to have a cigarette, and it maintains a sense of well-being when you're trying to get off the cigarettes. Now, it drives the dopamine levels through a different mechanism than the Chantix, and we're going to talk about the Chantix in a moment. The nicotine replacement therapy and any of these pharmacologic agents are not intended to be long-term medications. Uh, typically, people are off their full regimen within about 12 to 16 weeks. And so I like to frame the use of medications within that so that you understand that it's not something that you are going to have to be on long term. The patch, the gum, the lozenge, these are all items that we would slowly wean you off of over the course of 12 weeks and you would be on your way without any reliance on any of these medications. Now some people do continue to utilize medications like Wellbutrin because they feel like it really helps prevent relapse down the road and that's a decision that you can make with your medical provider. But it's just good for you to know that it's an option. Now a lot of people are interested in um, side effects of these medications. So let's talk about side effects to Wellbutrin. I've been prescribing these medications for about 15 years and I would say that the most um, prominent side effects to the Wellbutrin can be nausea, um, especially if people don't take it with food. It can be more activating than sedating, so it's often a medication you want to take in the morning versus nighttime. And it drives the dopamine levels up. Now, I find for smokers who already have, they're already acclimated to the dopamine levels in their brains, they tend to tolerate loading up on this medication very nicely. And in my practice, I use lower doses of this medication. It's uncommon. It would be rare uh, to require really high levels of this medication in more of the depression um, a dosing range. Um, usually, it is coupled with nicotine replacement therapy, and it's a very low dose, long acting um, uh, delivery. Now, the varenicline, also known as Chantix, is a medication that's gotten a lot of attention. Um, you may know that early in its career, it, has, it was labeled uh, with a black box label warning um, for concerns about suicidal uh, ideation. And I think it's really important to just call that out right away. This medication is not for everyone, neither is the Zy Zyban Wellbutrin. Um, the ticket is to really understand what these medications are, how they work, and then develop a personalized plan for yourself and with your medical provider to um, be successful in quitting smoking. Now, the varenicline is a very clever medication. The way it works is that it, you take it by mouth. It's a standard dosing for everyone, one milligram twice a day. But when you take the medication, it goes into your bloodstream, it goes to your brain, and it attaches to the exact same receptors that the uh, nicotine, when you inhale it, attaches to. It attaches to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And when it attaches, it creates that same lock and key mechanism and allows dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin, the uh, neurohormones that make your reward center feel good and your body feel good, occur. So it really mimics having a cigarette. In fact, the Chantix is a bit more potent at attaching to those nicotinic receptors than cigarettes are. And so if you're on the Chantix, it's not really intended to be utilized with the nicotine replacement therapy. And that's because they would both be competing for the same receptor. And Chantix is going to win out because it has a stronger polarity for those receptors. So it's really not necessary to utilize nicotine replacement therapy when you're going to be on that varenicline, also known as Chantix. Now, the most common side effect that I've seen as a prescriber is nausea. And if people take it with um, a solid meal and a full glass of water, you can usually mitigate that symptom. Um, People need to have a conversation with their medical provider. Not everybody are candidates for both or either of these medications, but if you take a look at the studies, people are much more successful with nicotine replacement therapy, counseling, 
and or pharmacologic agents like Welbutrin and varenicline, then not. And so if you're really um, sure that you want to quit smoking and moving forward with that uh, commitment, considering all of your options is important. I do want you to know that even if people have side effects to these medications, they often adjust. And if they're a side effect that you're not tolerating, those side effects go away as soon as you stop the medication. Now there's counseling and um, uh, internet options. Um, if you take a look at the studies, we know that counseling alone does not um, provide a really high chance of quitting smoking. It's ideally in combination with the nicotine replacement therapy and or the other pharmacologic agents we discussed. But counseling is a really important element of quitting smoking and it can be very helpful um, uh, for anyone who has smoked cigarettes or counseled someone who's um, been trying to quit smoking, you know that it can be, there can be good days and bad days. And so having uh, support can be very, very critical in that long-term quit attempt. Now in every state, there's a 1-800-QUIT-NOW number. You can dial it and um, there are different resources available and that's dependent on funding state by state. Some states are actually able to um, send out medication for free, uh, primarily the nicotine replacement therapy. So it may be worth it to reach out to your local 1-800-QUIT-NOW number. And they tip, uh, usually have uh, resources available where people will continue, trained professionals will continue to follow you over a duration of time to help you quit smoking. I've listed a couple different um, internet options as well. The American Lung Association has a Freedom from Smoking program. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has smokefree.gov. One of my favorites is the becomeanx.org. They're um, a great organization online that uh, can be very helpful in providing resources and online support and health ways as well, quitnet.com. So as I mentioned, treatment really does work. So let's talk about relapse. Relapse is not uncommon, and I want to define it first. So there's something called a lapse, and a lapse is when you have a cigarette or a few cigarettes, but you get back into your quit attempt um, or back into abstaining from cigarettes. A relapse is when you start smoking regularly and you basically resume your uh, prior uh, utilization of cigarettes for longer than seven days. We talked a little bit about this before, but having very realistic expectations when you're quitting smoking can be very helpful and help prevent lapse or relapse. I've listed a few uh, symptoms that are common in the um, uh, early phases of quitting smoking, including nicotine craving, which usually lasts less than two weeks, um, increased appetite that can last longer than 10 weeks, uh, depression, so remember, when you're transitioning off the cigarettes and there's alterations in the dopamine levels, you're going to ex experience some mood changes. And so many of these that I've listed here have to do with the drop in the nicotine level, especially going from smoking cigarettes and that quick delivery of nicotine and that high concentration to going to a nicotine replacement therapy that's not going to give you quite the pow. I find in my patients that the first two to three weeks is the toughest. That's when people are transitioning off the cigarettes to the nicotine replacement. They're adjusting their lifestyles, creating new habits um, uh, that doesn't incorporate cigarettes, and there can be a bit of moodiness and edginess. There can be sleep disruption, bowel disruption, and I just encourage people to really know and expect this, um, but plan for it eat healthy, hydrate well, uh, get out and exercise, um, think about what you can do to improve your overall well-being and switch up your life just a little bit when you're um, moving through this quit attempt. There's definitely, we, we've spent the whole um, time together uh, reviewing the effects, the physical impact that nicotine has on our bodies and what it means to come off of that nicotine via cigarettes. There is definitely a physiological component to smoking and that nicotine dependence, but there's also a behavioral component. Um, for many people, they've been smoking for decades. Cigarettes just tuck into many different 
uh, nooks and crannies of their lives. And um, it can take time to really get out of those routines and habits. Now, identifying your triggers is very important when you're going to make a quit attempt and move through that successfully. Identifying your triggers really helps you understand uh, when you should not have a cigarette. But you need to identify them like road signs. I think of triggers like road signs. If I came up to a stop sign and there was a stop sign in front of me, chances are I would slow down, hopefully come to a complete stop, look through the intersection before I advance through so that I don't get into trouble. Very similarly, when you come across a trigger, think about it like a road sign. Stop, think through it, make a plan, move through the intersection. And maybe part of that plan is going to the kitchen and having a tall glass of water, heading outdoors for a little walk without a cigarette, um, getting some nicotine replacement therapy in your mouth so that uh, you can get rid of that urge quickly. How to cope with a relapse. Assess what is not working. Think about what just happened. Why did that happen? What was the trigger? What was the situation you got into that made you have a cigarette? It's helpful to get rid of all the cigarettes so that you are reaching for your nicotine replacement therapy versus a cigarette. Identify why the lapse occurred. Do what has worked in the past. So most people know, sometimes people just kind of fall off the horse and they, um, they kind of get lax in using their nicotine replacement therapy or avoiding triggers or avoiding uh, circumstances, social situations where they may end up having a cigarette. So think through what has worked and re-engage that plan. Um, also may want to consider adding something to the regimen and uh, maybe that means that you've been using the nicotine replacement therapy but you need to go from an as needed use of the short acting nicotine replacement therapy to uh, using it routinely for a while just to get into a rhythm and uh, deliver that nicotine on a routine basis. For some people, it means adding something like uh, Wellbutrin to the uh, regimen to just give them a little extra oomph to avoid relapse. And just get back on the horse. I really like this slide. Um, don't let a relapse get the best of you. Giving up on a goal because of a setback is like slashing your other three tires because you got a flat. Don't get discouraged. Smokers are tough on themselves and it's very easy to get discouraged when um, they have a lapse or a relapse. Um, just making a plan, getting back on the horse, and putting it behind you is the best approach. Next steps, determine what treatment is right for you. We've talked about all the treatment options. Um, I will say that um, there are some uh, other modalities of treatment out there. People ask me all the time about hypnosis about acupuncture, massage, aromatherapy, behavioral therapy. Unfortunately, none of these have really been studied at length in the smoking population to understand what is helpful and what isn't, but it never hurts. And if you value some of those interventions, I would encourage you to include them in your regimen, if nothing else, for symptom relief. Get the supplies you need to make this quit attempt. See your healthcare provider if you need a prescription. Tell your friends and family about your plan to quit. Make that commitment publicly so that people understand what you're going through. It's helpful to even say, you know what, I might have some moody days. Just please hang in there with me. I don't expect it to last for more than two, three, four weeks. But I want you to know that I'm, I'm treating my nicotine dependence and um, I expect to get through this tell people what you're doing. Choose your quit date and initiate your treatment plan. So the most effective way to quit smoking is to engage with counseling, use of nicotine replacement therapy, and a pharmacologic agent. Identify and avoid your triggers. When you have a craving, redirect your activity for three minutes. Studies have demonstrated when you do that that even if you don't use the nicotine replacement therapy for that breakthrough urge, your urge to have a cigarette will go away. Know that the first seven to 10 days are the hardest, and remember it's never too late to quit smoking. To learn more about quitting smoking, you can visit our website at www.swedish.org backslash quit smoking. Thank you very much and good luck.